Hi, uh, thank you guys for coming to the Creating and Marketing Startup Panel Conversation. Um, uh, real quick introductions. My name is Michelle Kiefer. Uh, I am the director of marketing at Pressable. Uh, it's a hosting company, and uh, I've been in marketing for 12 years. I've specialized working with startups and SMBs. Uh, my background is in market research and strategic uh, development. Um, on our panel today, we have a nice variety of skills and expertise. We'll start with Bridget. Let her introduce herself and just kind of pass the mic. Hey y'all, I'm Bridget. You can find me at BridgetWiller.com. I have very distinct opinions on how you should use Twitter. Robert Nissenbaum, I'm the lead marketing wrangler here. I've been doing marketing of one sort or another for 20 something, almost 30 years. I've run and started up a number of my own businesses over that time. And Jocelyn Mozak, Mozak Design. I have been work. I've been building uh, WordPress-based websites for 11, 12 years now for small businesses. Cool. Um, so just getting started. Uh, raise your hand if you have or are currently building a startup. All right. Cool. Um, raise your hand if you just want to get better at marketing. Awesome. Um, so if you want to hear from people who have been in your shoes and experienced challenges, uh, this is why we're doing this. So you can kind of learn from our, uh, our experiences and uh, mistakes along the way, things that we've learned along the way. Um, so give a warm welcome to the panel and we will get started. Okay, so uh, we kind of separated this conversation into three main sections. Uh, the first section is about understanding who your audience is and how that relates to what your product or service is. A panel like this can go in a lot of different directions because everybody has very distinct needs for their specific uh, problem that they're trying to solve. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, and then we'll have a QA. and a uh, in that section, and then we'll move on to actually building uh, a WordPress and what the fundament, uh, a WordPress site and what those fundamentals are for the startup space specifically. And we'll have an opportunity to kind of Q and A there, and then we'll move into you know once you have your site, really how do you begin to amplify and market that outside of the space of your website? So you can save your questions to the end or kind of just throw them in. Um, also, if you are on Twitter. Uh, you can tweet us questions. Bridget will be fielding those as well. Um, just use uh, tag at WordCamp Seattle and use the hashtag startup panel, and we will see those questions. And so you can throw those in if you don't necessarily want to raise your hand and speak. Um, sound good? All right, cool. So um, identifying and, and targeting your audience uh, is kind of the square one for a startup is who, who are you trying to sell something to? Who are the early adopters? Um, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, so I'm going to start uh, by asking kind of what is your approach and how do you go about finding that information? For finding your, your ideal audience, some of it's going to be a bit of testing to see what works, but you should have a relatively good idea in terms of actually building out your, your marketing plans and your startup plan to begin with as to what your product solves or what your service is solving, it, the pain point piece of it. Then it's a matter of doing some basic research to at least figure out who might have those particular issues that you're trying to solve. And some of it can be done online through social media and trying to reach out and ask questions and do a bit of testing in that way. And then as you get responses back, you can start to narrow it down. And you'll have plenty to say. <laughs> okay, so this is a chicken and an egg question for me. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? It's a Sesame Street song. Sesame Street is 50 years old. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, like it's, uh, it's trending on Twitter right now, but here's the thing. Sometimes you find your voice and then your audience finds you, right? And then you realize, oh, I have something to sell. A lot of times that's what happens to makers. We solve a problem for ourselves or somebody near us. And then all of a sudden we realize, wow, I have this thing to sell. That's how I started. So once you, if you're doing that, you should have a persona, but you need to always audit it and you can audit that by looking at the demographics on Twitter, Facebook, 
and Google Analytics will tell you the demographics uh, according to what their measurements are. So don't just think, okay, I'm, I'm working with a WordPress developer. His name is Bob. He's 24 years old, lives in the basement of his parents' house. He hasn't taken a shower in a while because he's playing World of Warcraft with a catheter and like you and he likes craft beer like and he, sometimes he goes to word camp and he built a product right you can you can talk about it that way but i think that it's really important to realize that in effect a persona can be a stereotype and as we grow as people our our interests are going to change maybe bob is no longer you know pounding down pastrami because really he's he's decided to become a vegan he doesn't like beer anymore he likes gin and he's not playing world of warcraft anymore he's rehabbing arcade games right and you you know that by listening to the people that you're talking to and you do that on social media so you it's very easy to automate social media and then and then stop listening to your audience and what they're talking about. And that's why it's important to have that audience and persona, but continuously audit it. Um, so one thing I would also say, you know, when we're talking about the startup and putting things out there, it's never too early to start the conversation and start sort of engaging and connecting with your prospective audience, don't build it and then try to sort of sell it, right? Because in having that conversation, you're going to potentially pivot and learn and adjust what you're building. Um, so that would be my thing. Don't, don't polish it till it's perfect. Cause sometimes we can have this ideal perfectionism, right? And we, we think we have to get the perfect thing out there and we're really polishing almost the wrong thing. So go out there with the imperfection and start the conversations as early as possible. Okay. Um, so. I hear a lot of, you know, kind of testing who your audience is. Social is a really good place for that. What about looking at competitive or competitors or potential competitors in your space? And uh, which is, do you feel like piggybacking on another product or service that's similar and kind of copying and mimicking what they're doing versus seeing what they're doing and trying to differentiate from them and stand apart? What to kind of find? How do you incorporate what your competitors are doing? And in some startups, you don't have competitors, so this is kind of a mute point. But if you are have a if you have a startup that's similar to a product or service that's already out there, how can you leverage that to help identify your audience? So I think these two may have different opinions than me. In some ways, I don't worry about my competitors, or every market at this point is in many ways flooded, right? There is a lot of things out there. And so when you start focusing on everyone else, you start almost trying to copy it and try to do business their way. Um, kind of one of my big soapboxes is, is create your business your way. And so in some ways, I mean, it's good to do all the research, but there's a certain amount of eyes on your own page and really be true to yourself and what you're building and what you're discovering. And, you know, just, I don't know, I think there's a lot of, um, just stay authentic to what you are doing because then you are creating something unique. If you start essentially looking at everyone else, you may just be duplicating and not bringing anything new to the table. I agree. I, one of the things we get to is at this point, <laughs> It's not your turn yet. <laughs> One of the things we get caught in the habit of is always trying to watch what our competitors are doing and how they're putting products out and what they're doing for marketing and trying to get into their audiences and we stop focusing on what we're doing or what we're best at. It's not so much having to match what they're doing. It's a good guide. So I had to find out from a, from a competitor who they're targeting and what their audience is and see what kind of results they're getting. And it's, it's, it's feedback for me that do I want to do something similar? Do I want to look in a different place? Do I even want the same type of clients? And as you begin to do what you do a little bit more, it all gets tailored down. So even to a point where Bridget and I are technically competitors, half the stuff she does or people she works with, I won't. And it's still within the same industry. So if I was simply watching what she's doing on Twitter, then again, you lose that authenticity piece as well. And uh, Dustin Stout over Warfare Plugins has made this comment several times when people ask about, well, I, what do I blog about? I've always, everybody else has already said it. You haven't said it. It's your voice that may resonate. It's your service that may resonate. It's not simply the service. So you've got to bring yourself into it. So don't get caught up 
in focusing so deeply on what your com competitors are doing that you lose sight of what you want to do. Okay, so this happens a lot in automobile and um, the beverage industry. So we were just chatting about last night, you know, you might find a really great and be super loyal to a brand because it's a microbrewery, but then it gets bought by AB and then you're like, I don't like this anymore, right? So you have to look at your competitors and does their culture fit yours? If they are uh, a culture fit, then maybe you can replicate some of their things, but Watching your competitors and replicating their behavior presumes something very big, that they're actually successful. And a lot of times there's vanity metrics involved. We think we're successful because we say we're successful, and you think I'm successful because I say that I'm successful, and I keep saying I'm successful, but you know, you don't know if I'm close to bankruptcy, right? You don't know how unhappy people are. So some of the tools you can use are Twitter search for their name. Um, you can do Google alerts. I do that all the time, see what people are talking about and ask people the question. So I'm working with vendor fuel right now. People came up to us, do you build e-commerce? No, why not? Because I don't like working with WooCommerce. So in that way, that helps us in some ways, but we're not a competitor to WooCommerce because they do their own thing their own way, right? So it depends on the culture you want to put forward in your customer base and whether or not that loyalty matters. Because when small breweries are taken up by Anheuser-Busch, it ruins that culture. So it's more of a acquisition and distribution um, kind of situation. And so do you want to emulate them? No, because they don't resonate with your audience and then you'll lose the people you do have who have been loyal to you. Does anybody else have any questions on the topic of identifying your audience before we move on to the next section of the conversation? No. All right. Those are anything. No, okay. Um, so now let's talk. So once you kind of have an, an understanding of what problem you're solving, um, you know who, you think you have an idea of who you're going to be solving it for. Um, you've done a little bit of testing. You've done a little bit of research. And now you're ready to build your WordPress site for that audience. Um, you know, one of the great reasons why WordPress is, a, is good for publishers is, or uh, is good for startups is because it's so easy to publish. You own everything. And just right from the get-go, you can kind of take total control. So what would you all consider to be kind of the top assets or pages that you need to include on your site? That, and again, it's going to be different based on what that audience is and what your product or service is. But what are some of those core fundamentals for building a WordPress site? Um, to really uh, showcase what your brand is and the problem you're solving. Let's see. I'm trying to think. I'm not sure I'm thinking of it as key pages. I mean, I think all of us would probably say when you're starting out, you need, obviously, you have your home and you have your contact, right? I think of it more as maybe the key pieces you need to ensure you have. Um, you're going to want to make sure that um, on your site, it's very easy for your customer to get in touch with you. So never hide your contact information. That should be front and center and simple to see. Um, one thing I would share that I think is wonderful about WordPress in this space, especially when you're starting a new business, remember that you can keep changing it, right? It's not like a book that goes to print. So use WordPress and do it so you don't wait to create that website until you have everything. You can just get started and you can grow with it and change it and it will grow with you as you grow in your company. You know, I'm not quite answering your question. Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay. So contact information is important. Exactly. Recognizing that what you start with is not necessarily what you're going to finish with. Exactly. Okay. Definitely things. And then, well, those are my two. I have other ideas, but I'm going to let these guys interject some stuff because I don't know if there's a whole long list. I'm trying to get back to the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your about page is a big piece of it. And most people overlook it or have a very poor about page. But part of what gets clients, and I'll go back into my little marketing soapbox, is everybody that's done marketing or does marketing in any way, shape, or form has always has heard the expression, people do business with or refer business to those they know, like, and trust, right? The problem is it's wrong. It is to a point because know, like, and trust are not exclusive. 
which means as a consumer, I can know, like, and trust six or seven different competing brands. So where's my business going to go? It then comes down to things like price, convenience. Do I get a coupon in the mail? Or is there something above and beyond that? There's one variable that takes some of that out of the equation, and that becomes a relationship. That the more you're connected with somebody, the more you're going to go back to that brand than going to somewhere new. I'll drive across the street or change directions on my way home or go a bit out of my way or spend a few dollars more to do business with somebody I have this relationship with. This is a connection. I would have sites built by Jocelyn before I went to somebody that was brand new, even if they were cheaper or potentially could do the same thing. And we also stop looking in many cases. So that about page that hones you in and really what who you are and what your brand is about becomes extremely important as a way to connect with your clients. Which is why it's really important to write your bio in a way that humanizes you. Show your personality. Don't we don't want to read your resume. That's for LinkedIn. I don't care how many degrees you have or whatever. It's not important. Who are you? And so that's really an important aspect of your about page, or it, it doesn't even have to be on the contact page, but on that about page and throughout your site, you should be showing your personality. Um, that is a really important, that's more of a branding question, right? But the other thing I would like to interject is having landing pages, especially that don't necessarily um, that aren't necessarily on the navigation. So if, for example, I do small group training for social media, I do it for franchisees. I do it for small businesses. I do it for WordPress developers. Those are landing pages. They're not necessarily in my navigation, but if people are looking for franchise training, um, on how to use social media for your franchise business, then they can find me. That's all I want. I just want it there, like either if I want to send it to them or they can find me. Not everything has to be in your main navigation. So that's a good segue for this next topic of as you're building out these core pages, making sure people can contact you, making sure people get a good idea of who you are and what your brand is really about, uh, building out you know, specialized landing pages for specific niche audience uh, options to be found, which is, you know, how else, what else can you be doing while you're building your site for visibility and kind of top tips for building with SEO and making sure that you don't put everything into it and then come back and put a, you know, an SEO plugin on top to solve your problems. But really from the beginning, while you're building your web, your WordPress site, how are you thinking about that visibility factor and that SEO factor, whether it's on your contact page or your about us page or these specialized landing pages? From an SEO perspective, from Google's perspective, site flow is a big piece of it. You have to have the core fundamentals there. So your URL slugs, your title, titles for pages and for posts, your meta descriptions, the core pieces have to be there. That's all the technical aspects. Because once that's in place, Google sees the site now as professional and you can build off of it. If you're missing that data, if you're missing alternate image tags, if you're missing any snippet data, those are all things later that are gonna hurt you and it's gonna take a long time to recover from. So everything published has to have that in mind first. The interesting thing is it's not always about how pretty the site is and most people seem to look for the prettier site as long as people can move through it and find what they want, that's your goal. And the second piece is not to be so focused on the SEO that you forget about focusing on the content and who it's for. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing and the biggest piece of advice I would give in the site is remembering that the website is actually not about you. It's about the problem you're solving. And this ties into SEO too, right? We tend not to Google, we, are, we search for things when we're in pain. So we are searching in the language of what's wrong and what's going on. We don't necessarily know what the solution is. We know what our problem is and we know where we want to be. Your service is how they're going to get there. But when you're writing, write in the language. First of all, again, it's not about you. Even the about page is only half about you. It's more targeted towards how you still are there to serve them. Um, and so when you do your writing, make sure that you are speaking in the language of their issues and let them know that you get where they are, you get where they're going. 
And only once they know that you can help them, now they're interested in who you are. So client first. I mean, just to reiterate what they're saying, if you do use jargon, define it. Because not everybody knows what a glue lamp beam is. I've learned this when I was in construction. We don't know, we know our industry terms. You know your product's name. So it's fine to use your jargon, but define it. And on the jargon, just one more thing with keywords. Generally, I don't do much in way of keyword research. My brand site's five years old. I have never paid any attention on any sort of keyword research, and I'm ranking for over 450, almost 460 different terms at this point. If you know what you're talking about, if you are the expert in your industry, as you write, as you create your content, wherever it is, the language that people are going to use to find you are there. Where keyword research comes in real handy is understanding what your clients and customers refer to your product as or their need as. Uh, different languages. So if you're marketing to something in England, it's going to be a little bit different than the phrases you use here. That's really understanding your, your audience more so than it is trying to rank for something specific. Because if your content is directed to the audience and you're using language that you would normally use in everyday conversation, your site will rank. And also just make sure that you write and all of your things are with your customer in mind. They don't necessarily, we tend to get all excited as service-based providers talking about, we're really good at what we do and here's what we do and go really deep into what it is we do. That's why they're hiring us. They don't want to know that. They want to know that we understand what's going on and that we can solve it. But all of the kind of the, the muck of the how you do your job, that doesn't need to be there. That's not what they're looking for. I have a question. Okay. I feel like Bill Donahue. Uh, that just aged me. So a picture wall from Twitter says, what are your thoughts on the style of voice you should use on your site? Always serious? Can you be playful? Should you work on developing an authentic, unique voice or just be natural and go for it? Be yourself. So if you're naturally playful, that should be the voice you have. That when somebody talks to you in public, that's the same language they're going to see, read, hear when they go to your website. It should be consistent across the board. I will push boundaries. I get a little edgy on certain content. If I'm going to say in public and I don't care who hears it, I will post it online. <laughs> I do too. I mean, speak in the language of your brand. And since many of us are our brand, it's you, let that shine through. As a matter of fact, when you do that, when you bring yourself, now you're memorable. Now you're someone we can connect with. Um, if you sound like everybody else, moving on, right? Okay, so here's the thing. Thank you for the question. Um, don't, don't be patronizing. Now, now that's, a, that's, a, that's a little, gray line because i'm known for being super snarky like i just made a video saying stop using stupid hashtags you know and like i will say i can say that because i've known to say that so in your humor you have to like you know humor is tricky because not everybody likes your sense of humor so it's fine like i always say i'm like cilantro you either like it or you don't that's that's my personality so be cautious with how playful you are. Make sure that your audience really does like it. Because if you're reading their tweets, you know what they like, right? But to be even more specific, fifth grade reading level, active voice, that's what newspapers do. That's what you should do in your copywriting. Okay, slight point of disagreement now. <laughs> <laughs> You're, uh, so one of the things people get afraid of doing is offending anybody else. That we want to be as neutral as possible to not alienate part of our audience. But the interesting thing is that you're also not taking a side at that point. And usually if you alienate one group, you're going to create a much more loyal following the other group because you stood up and said something that they believe in, and they're now instantly your raving fans. So I am not opposed, and I've done this numerous times in speaking at events, where I know something I'm going to say is going to offend 50% of the audience instantly and sometimes it's the very beginning of what i'm talking about but i now know that that 50 percent i can ignore 
I now can focus on the other 50%. I mean, not ignore in that way, but the, the idea is that I know they're not going to be clients. I'm not speaking to them. My content is now not for them. I'm trying to focus on that other 50% that I know are still there. That's why I said it's like cilantro. You either like it or you don't. Yeah. Well, in that my case, yeah. All right. So we want to be authentic, uh, be bold in being yourself, recognizing that your audience is going to either uh, like you or not like you, but that's what audience segmentation is ultimately. Um, every, you know, a lot of startups get into this, uh, this assumption, you know, they, they've got a really great tool and anybody can use it and any, it can solve problems for anybody. And even if that is really true, the reality is that doesn't mean that anyone's going to buy it. And so you, there is a point where you really have to start to make those hard decisions of, but who is actually going to give me money for what I'm trying to sell? Um, and, and looking at doing, you know, zeroing in and filtering in on them. And then it's, and which kind of brings into it's, it's quality, not quantity, right? You can focus on staying agnostic and spreading your message really wide. Um, but then it's kind of watered down with versus being really authentic to who you're trying to be and allowing your audience that you resonate with to, to segment themselves out based on how you're positioning yourself. Yeah. Okay. So kind of taking a couple steps back out of the rabbit hole, um, back to building out that content and, and, and how do you go, you, Rob, you mentioned, um, site flow and how important that is and understanding how people are going to be using your site and moving through your site. So uh, what are some of the strategies or methodologies that you guys employ uh, in, in determining how, this is probably Jocelyn, you probably have the most experience here of how to map that content out, which pay, how do you, you know, we identified already, you know, contact pages are important. The about me section is important. Um, specialized landing pages to meet your audience needs are important, but you know, how are you mapping that out? Where are you building content first and how do you make those decisions? Or, you know, do you wireframe? Do you sticky note? Kind of what's your thought process more so than what do you do? So this is less of a recommendation question, but more of how do you approach it question. I, I like the sticky note idea. That's actually great when you have huge sites and like huge navigations and you're trying to reorganize, put sticky notes and then start like playing with your navigation. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. I, I think the piece would be the starting point for me when, I'm, when I've got clients and we're trying to set up a site or get something new is for them to give you a list of what they want and what their thought process is behind the flow of it. And then that has to go over to a developer or somebody that can build that site, knowing now what you want and then letting them do it the way they see it. So that there's a, a piece that has to be left into the hands of the developer instead of trying to tie their hands and micromanage them. I mean, the key thing is, especially when it comes to the homepage, is it's not a place to put the kitchen sink. Not everything needs to be on the homepage. As a matter of fact, the more you throw on there, the more you dilute it. Um, simple, uh, I, want, I just want a simple site is a developer's like worst thing to hear because you're like, you don't know what you want, do you? Because simple and elegant and getting it down to those clear things is actually really tough. What you'll want to think about, especially with the homepage, is okay, what, do, what action do I want them to take? So they're coming to your site. Great, they're here. Now what? What's your goal? What are you trying to get them to do? And it's very easy to be like, oh, I want to show them this, and I need to show them this, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. It's like, no, stop. Prioritize the top three things, then two things, and down to one thing. You really want to get laser focused on what your messaging is and what you want them to do. Um, this is where it's really important that right off the bat, they can identify that they're on the right, they're in the right place. So this is where it's so important to speak to what their pain is. They can immediately zero in on, okay, they solved my problem. Great. And they'll keep going from there. So my focus as a content person has mostly been audits and I work with agencies who do this. So a lot of times we just, um, export the site map into a Google sheet or your spreadsheet of choice and then we realize like how important is this do we want to keep it is it outdated uh, does it need to be rewritten so from that standpoint sometimes uh, on a site we just did with sea turtle inc it it was just there were too many child pages and we realized as a team that that needed to be a custom post type right so sometimes with the audits 
just a spreadsheet helps if you're doing a rebuild. And I'm gonna borrow a line from Matt in the back of the room. Test, don't guess. That Google Analytics will give you a huge amount of insight once your site's built as to how people are moving through it and how they're landing on specific pages. And you can actually, after you have enough data, get this behavior flow. They come on this page, they move to this page. So you can actually change your navigation based on where they're landing most and where they're going to next. So you can manipulate the site navigation. So like your website isn't stagnant the whole time, your menu and your internal navigation structure has to change as well. And it's not just like, again, moving the posts to a page or deciding whether it's a page or a post, but also looking at them once you have data to see where things should still be. And make sure to basically take your visitor by the hand through the site. The last thing you want to do is have a bunch of content get to the bottom of the page and now they're sitting here going, uh, I guess I'll scroll back up to the top and see what's in the navigation. Tell them what you want them to do. Take them deeper into your site. Actually invite them, put out your hand and say, you know, take the next step. You know, now that this is a fit, this is the right thing for you, here's where we go from here. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions about uh, determining how to map and build your content in this space? And based on anything, Craig? No? Yes. So I have a client and they like to open up no, I have a client and they like to open all of their internal links in new tabs in the browser. <laughs> and I I can't give them a I have not been able to determine from my skill set how to tell them to stop doing it. I know they shouldn't, but I can't figure out how to tell them to stop doing that. And am I wrong? Should they be okay doing that? Is that an okay thing to do? Tell them to stop doing that. Okay. It's an annoying user experience, right? Every time I click, I've got another tab. I mean, perusing that site would just be hell. Um, usually the only time you are wanting to open something in a new window and you do want to do this, well, there's some controversy on it, but my general recommendation is when they're going off your site. So when it's within your site, you go deeper. And maybe if it's, well, I think PDFs by default open up in a new window anyways. So offsite, yes, because you want yours to still be around. Thank you very much. Within your site, no, don't do that. <laughs> Everything I do when I'm optimizing content, thinking about Google and the reader, internal links always open in the same window, external links always open in a new window or a new tab. And I want them to stay on my site and I have found too many times where I'll bounce off, even clicking on a Facebook link, I'm suddenly off the site and on Facebook. Well, now I can't remember where I was and I screwed up my back button and I can't get back to where I was. And I've actually lost sites that way. And the other thing it does is it gives Google more information that they're clicking links, but still staying on your site. So it gives you another way to look at it. If you're simply opening in multiple windows, Google can be seeing those in a very different way and it's not gonna give you a true picture of what they're doing on your site. Good question. Any other questions about content mapping or where to put what? No silly questions. <laughs> so you guys talked about landing pages and home pages. Is it the same thing? <laughs> So landing pages are pages that are specifically designed to speak to sort of a laser focused topic. Whereas your homepage, I don't want to say it's more general, but it's probably more general. It's, it's speaking to your business solution as opposed to laser focused. Um, you can probably speak to landing pages in SEO, I would assume. Oh, it's like, for me, I don't even think about landing pages in SEO. I use them for understanding how people are getting to my site. So that from a marketing perspective, if I want to make sure you land in a specific page or I want to know if you're getting to where I want you to go, I can send you right to that landing page and bypass everything. And it may not be even a, a page that's linked anywhere because then I know when that page is hit, I know content got them there. I can, I can get an idea even without additional tracking codes as to what content got them there. And I can then see what they do afterwards to see if I've got everything in my, idea, in my mind mapped as to where they're going and whether I'm solving a problem or not. So landing pages are, can help you identify more information. It's not so much just for making it easier for the client. And another way to think about it, sorry, I'm interrupting. Um, 
I didn't know you were about to answer. You can go first. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here's, I mean, I did bring up landing pages. So a marker's got to be a marker, right? So a landing page should be clean, super clean, like as clean as possible. You want them to ha have a button to do whatever you want them to do. They, they call it a call to action. So like for me, I have a form. I want them to fill that form out and tell me, tell them how I can help help their business grow or whatever. But it, the copy is written specifically for an audience. Usually we like to say, who's my audience? My audience is Bob. He blah, 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 blah. Usually you have several segments so some t and, and different products. As, or services. So those, so for example, I train franchisees how to use social media. That's very specific. So that page is a landing page. You, you want is less fuss. You don't want sidebars. You don't want a bunch of stuff. It's, it's like when you're in a checkout and you, you see the Snickers and you're like, Oh yeah, I am hungry. And you buy it. It's impulse based upon searches and based upon you sending them there and specifically promoting and or doing advertising campaigns specifically for that. So if you ever listen to ESPN radio, they'll go LinkedIn, LinkedIn jobs is the best place to go. 70% of your new recruits are from LinkedIn. Go to LinkedIn jobs slash jobs, linkedin.com slash jobs, go to linkedin.com slash jobs that's a landing page so specifically they know that that traffic came because of that ad on espn now it's your turn um i'll move on <laughs> uh so any other questions about content mapping and getting your site Okay, so now we know how to think about building who are who we're building for. Um, we have a pretty good idea of how to start developing the site to capture that audience, whether it's they're coming directly into your site and navigating or finding you from other out external channels and landing on a landing page and going forward. So um, outside of the website or uh, what are ways that you can uh, amplify your message. So this becomes uh, the, are you publishing on blogs versus publishing on social um, where the space is to um, amplify your message? So my panel decided to start reverse. This is really where I shine. No, for real. Um, so everything should lead, all roads lead to your website. And a lot of times people talk about SEO, I call it findability. So you, you want to be found on the internet. Okay. Let's just put it in real terms. You want people to find you from searching on Bing or Google or whatever, or Doug, go duck, whatever you want to be private. Okay. Duck, duck, goose. I don't know. You're it. Okay. So the thing is, you want people to find that website because that's where you own the data. You do not own your content on Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, whatever's going to come next, Snapchat, whatever. You don't own that content. So you can distribute and repurpose content on your website on those social media channels, but they should as much as possible, lead the user to your website, eventually, if not in that exact post. Robert will tell you some alternate <laughs> theories. Alternate or right ones. Um, so the question is to whether content should belong and go on where you're posting content initially, whether it's a website or social media or some other place. The first piece on being found, even Google tell you now you shouldn't be relying just on Google search. So you want to make sure you are having traffic coming to your website from multiple sources. It needs to be organic. It needs to be direct. It needs to be referral. It needs to be through social channels, through email, so that you're not beholden to any one thing. If I decided to scrap everything SEO related, I still wouldn't lose all my traffic or even a significant portion of it at this point. As to where the content goes in the first place, my core evergreen content, stuff that really won't change over time, Will, you, will always live first on my website. That's content then in the future, I can simply update, add some information, tweak a bit, but I'm not gonna have to redo them. I went back when I redid my site and there were probably 15 to 20 articles that were at this point outdated, mute, they were, what things they were talking about didn't exist. They were deleted. Yeah, like Google Plus. So there's a lot, so if you're 
writing about trends or writing about current things, I try to leave that stuff on LinkedIn as a primary source or maybe medium or smaller versions of it on other social channels. There's other times where I have something to say that it's just really a little blurred. It doesn't have a place on my website. It'll go on social media and I'll try and tie it back into a core article. So the post will simply be about whatever I'm ranting about. And usually they'll tie into something on my site. So I'll include that link. But posting stuff on social media is also a great way to find out whether you should be going more into depth on it on your website. So when we're looking at content, the best place to start testing content to see what kind of reactions you get or if people are interested in it. If you've built your social audiences properly, not just randomly asking people to like your damn stuff, you'll get a sense of what content seems to be going over well and what you should be spending more time on for your website. And then that plays into looking at your analytics and seeing if your theories are actually the case. Because a lot of times we think, but we need to check and modify and pivot as a result of that. Okay, so we're almost out of time. So I've got uh, a question that you can only answer in one sentence. You cannot, it's gotta be brief and then we'll open up to more Q and A. Um, what is your recommendation for any tools or plugins that can help amplify out beyond that content? And this, because you also wrote about this, and it's my big thing. Make sure your website is set up to be shared socially. Make sure all your content can be shared socially. Revival post. What is revival post? Oh, I was trying to be succinct. I said revival post. post. Sentence. You get a sentence. Uh, revival post is a plugin that will cycle your content. Um, based upon, it's free, it has a premium. Uh, based upon the number of hours you want, you can tell it how old or how new uh, to cut it off, whether or not to use hashtags, extra, you know, a lot of times they'll go, did you miss, question mark, and, it, and then it tweets out uh, an older article um, every 18 hours or whatever I decide. I go anywhere between seven and 23 hours. I'm always futzing with it. But that way, it's it's constantly cycling out. And then I exclude things like poetry, which I had on Medium. doesn't really belong on my site, but I don't want it to only live there. So I don't need my old poems just like cycling out. Not a plug-in, but if you're going to be sharing your content on social, featured image. Make sure it looks good when you push it out. Okay. Um, so any other questions about, uh, I know we kind of ran out of time here at the end, but about amplifying outside of your website. Hi, I've just started doing landing pages and stuff on my uh, site. And uh, right now I'm collecting traffic, which has been pretty much nothing. Uh, through my own email, and I've been I've used Mailchimp on other sites that I've developed for other people, and I've looked at HubSpot and ConvertKit. Do you recommend any of those plugins, or do you think it's better to cycle it through your own Gmail or whatever account that you're using? It, and I'll just, you can't do it through your own Gmail account. It's got to come from the brand. I mean, first you're. Either way, but you wanted a brand, it lists as a brand, you want to use another tool that gives you additional analytics. So even if it's just MailChimp and it's just the free because you've got under 2,000 users, they're still going to give you things like open rates, click rates. It's still going to tell you what's clicked. It's going to give you more insight as to what, whether or not it's working or what is working. I mean, you also run into as your list gets bigger, being seen as a spammer, sending out that many, that big of an email blast. So yes. Use MailChimp. That's usually probably one of the best free ones right now. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's not the Okay. Other questions? I have many times heard, and um, based on your thing that your um, featured image should look good, don't use stock images. Now, if you don't use stock images, what do you use? I mean, I don't have <laughs> photographers sitting around me. <laughs> so 
Don't use that. If absolutely po possible or impossible, then a stock image makes some sense. But if I see that same image somewhere show up on somebody else's content somewhere else, you've just lost incredible amounts of credibility with me. I usually, I hate taking pictures, but I will randomly take pictures of all kinds of odd things because I never know what I took a picture of that actually would work a year later for a piece of content. So I always have images available. And then the other one is that there are tools available that you can use to create stuff pretty quickly. So it's like we tag team this and actually prepare it. Here's the thing, we, we work together. So um, yes, build your own stock library, but unsplash.com is awesome. Attribution and creative, uh, attribution free creative commons. But use a tool like Canva and then make whatever you do, like I have the image and then I have a, a like a line, you know, just a block, of one of my brand colors with a title. So it needs to be 1200 by 628 pixels for Facebook who rules the playground of open graph data. And if you ever, ever want to boost that post and have it serve, make sure that there is less than 20% of the area and text. This is very important. If you want to test your image, Google Facebook image overlay, and you can upload it to them and they will tell you um, based on green, yellow, whatever. If it's not green, they're not gonna serve it and you're not gonna be able to advertise and a story. But they try to like make it all nice and whatever. Blah. And depending on your brand with those featured images, all of mine look the same for every piece of content. Bridget's do the same thing because it's brand consistency. So when you see a post come through, you just have to know that that background that's in it is my, is my content. Yeah, and to clean mine up when I'm feeling lazy and you want it to be simple because yes, one more image and does the image align with the brand. What I've done for blog posts is use something like Canva, create something that nicely has my logo, a good background, and then I pull out essentially like the takeaway from the blog post, some quote or something. So it's kind of like you have your text with the sort of pull in it line. Now this, maybe you can't boost it, so oh well. But, and then it has um, the visual with sort of that, that line that grabs you. And, and that gives me a nice quick, like I can crank it out without having to be like, Ugh, can't find a good stock photo. And no, you, ideally you shouldn't use them, but yes, it gets hard and you give up sometimes. P.S. Don't boost posts on Facebook, run targeted ads. Did you both get Other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you guys for sharing all your expertise and knowledge. Thank you for coming and listening and asking questions. Um, yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day. Happy work camp, y'all.